I'm Eric, um, and this is an ice shelf just off the north coast of Ellesmere Island in the Canadian Arctic. And this is interesting for my purposes because um, this ice shelf has um, relatively extensive microbial mats covering it uh, that are dominated by cyanobacteria. And in particular, um, these cyanobacteria have some of the highest concentrations of cytonemin, uh, a pigment that we're going to be talking about. This is a photoprotective pigment. It uh, absorbs UV radiation and helps protect the cyanobacterial cells. And um, it makes sense that in this kind of environment, um, cyanobacteria would produce quite a lot of it because this is a very exposed environment. And not only is the sun shining from the top, but also there's a very reflective surface. And, and thus, it's very hard to escape this this radiation. As anyone would know who has uh, maybe spent some time skiing in the, in the spring, uh, it's very hard to avoid um, getting sunburned. Um, so if we look at zoomed in pictures of these types of mets, we can see quite a bit of this, this, this brownish or dark orange pigment, which is, which is what cytonemin looks like in visible light. Um, here is an absorption spectrum of cytonemin. This is the, the solid line with an S. Um, and you can see that it is best at absorbing in the uh, long wavelength end of the, uh, of the UV um, spectrum. So, so UVA is, is where, it, um, where it absorbs the best. And you can also see that in the visible light, it doesn't really absorb anything in sort of the, the yellow and red region. And that's why it, why it looks yellowish and, and, and reddish in the visible light. Um, there is another set of... Um, compounds that cyanobacteria use for this type of UV photoprotection. They are the mycosporin-like amino acids. Um, and this is something that I want to look at in future work, actually. Um, so when we first started looking at um, this particular compound and the history of its biosynthesis, um, one thing that, that occurred to us as a relevant environmental factor that would influence the production of, of, of cytonemin in, in the past is, is obviously the, the oxygen level, because, because in, in today's world, at least, it, it is the ozone layer that mostly modulates how much UV radiation gets onto the ground and, and how much the organisms have to deal with it. And uh, so this is a, a famous um, graph by, by Tim Lyons and others. Um, and depicts the, the oxygen history on Earth, showing um, sort of two general increases in oxygen level, one um, about 2.4, 2.3 billion years ago, uh, referred to as the Great Oxygenation Event, and one in the, in the late Neoproterozoic, um, about uh, 600, 650 million years ago. Um, and so this clearly would have had an influence on the presence of the ozone layer, because ozone is, is made out of oxygen photochemically. So before here, there would be very little ozone layer. Here, things would, would change a bit. And here, you know, something close to the modern um, ozone layer would probably appear. Now, this, this UVA radiation is interesting in that the ozone layer doesn't really do much to it, to be honest. But what is interesting about it is that this UVA radiation actually becomes dangerous to organisms in the presence of oxygen. Because UVA is very good at making various reactive oxygen radicals that are then injurious to living cells. So for our purposes, actually, this curve is, is, is more relevant as a time, um, as a showing when exactly oxygen arose in such a way that perhaps now UVA protection would be necessary. Another thing that, as shown on the first picture, might influence um, cytonemin levels in organisms is um, glaciations, and in particular, perhaps the most extensive and, and then largest ones, the global glaciations of the Paleoproterozoic and the Neoproterozoic. And so, you know, especially in some of the more extreme hard snowball scenarios that people have proposed, you know, where you have a global sea glacier, where all the oceans are covered with hundreds of meters of water, one of the central questions is, um, how to sustain complex life in these systems, which, which did happen. And one necessary component for that is obviously um, that someone somewhere needs to do photosynthesis. And one thing that has been um, proposed is that perhaps 
there were cyanobacteria in, um, in meltwater ponds probably close to the equator. Um, and then perhaps these environments do not look unlike what we see today in, in places like Ellesmere Island. Um, so again, if this was the case, then perhaps we would, we would expect to see interesting developments in cytonemin production at, at these times. And, and then maybe more so than in today's polar environments, because here we're talking about equatorial environments where, where the intensity of radiation is, is harsher than, than today in the polar areas. So very briefly, um, cytonemin um, is, is this, this pigment here. It is, it is synthesized based on relatively, um, relatively basic organic compounds, tryptophan, uh, prefenate are, are some precursors. And there is this set of, of, um, of proteins called Psi A through, through Psi F that do most of the synthes synthesis. And I'll briefly also be mentioning uh, some other proteins that mainly, um, that mainly make the precursors for this, um, for this synthesis. Uh, now, these relevant genes um, which contain the information for these proteins are collected into one cluster in the genomes of organisms that have this, they're one operon, and we will be talking mostly about these yellow ones, Psi A through Psi F. Um, this is a, a phylogenetic tree of one of them, of, 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 of Psi C, its versions in different organisms. I don't expect you to be able to read the names, but I will talk about the general structure of this tree. Um, this shows how the Psi C's in different organisms are related to each other, and uh, we can see that there is this, there is this large group of of Nostocales, these are certain mostly, mostly terrestrial um, cyanobacteria that live in large colonies. Um, and, and if we look actually at, at this whole tree, or even if we look within Nostocales, we can actually see that this, that this tree reflects the species tree relatively well. Um, and even if we look beyond the Nostocales, we see that the closest sister group is this genus Crococcidiopsis, uh, and beyond that we have some, some more distantly related um, cyanobacteria. This basically looks exactly the same as a, a species tree of, um, of, of this clade of cyanobacteria. Here we can see the, uh, here we can see the Nostocales, we can see Crococcidiopsis, the, um, the closest sister group in our study as well. And some of the things sort of in the top part of, the, uh, of our tree here are, are these things that are sister to, to Nostocales and, and Crococcidiopsis. So basically, it seems that what has happened is that the capacity to produce cytonemin arose in some common ancestor of, of this clade here, and has since been vertically inherited by, by its descendants. Lost in some of them, but, but not, not that many of them. So, so here, um, now we, this is an existing species tree of cyanobacteria that was made uh, a few years ago, uh, many different well-conserved genes, including ribosomal protein, uh, ribosomal protein genes and things like that were used for that. And so what, the reason why I wanted to, um, wanted to check my tree against this is mainly to date when exactly cytonemin production would have appeared. And um, basically that would mean that we would need to determine where exactly this last common ancestor of the clades that have the cytonemin production capacity existed. And so this node is sort of about here. Um, so, so maybe you know, somewhere between 2.0 and, and 2.5 billion years ago is when, when this clade with cytonemin uh, diverges from, from other cyanobacteria that do not have cytonemin. Um, below, I have a different tree, which is from the same paper. It just makes slightly different assumptions um, about um, molecular evolution rates. And it uses slightly different calibrations and you can see that here, this uh, relevant, relevant branching event is pushed back maybe slightly, uh, slightly more to about 2.5, again, with, with some uncertainties, as you can see from the error bars over here. So, that's, so, so, so from our study, it seems that this is something that, that was developed maybe somewhere between two and, and two and a half billion years ago. Um, and there was very recently, about, about two months ago, another paper by, uh, by people from uh, Arizona State University where they also made an effort to, to date um, cyanobacter the cyanobacteria production of cytonemin. 
they used a different set of genes. They actually looked at these, at these genes that are responsible for the production of the precursors to um, the cytonemin biosynthesis. And uh, in, the, in the orange here, you can see uh, the, the dates for um, origin of cytonemic production that they got from looking at different genes. They made separate molecular clocks for, for each of these genes. And you can see that there is quite a bit of variability, but in, in general, um, again, um, the placement would be somewhere here just above um, two uh, billion years ago. I marked that, the GOE here in, in uh, blue. So this timing is interesting not just for, for, cyto for sort of cytonemin and for understanding um, UV radiation protection, but also, um, obviously, it says something more generally about when cyanobacteria uh, developed and when important evolutionary events concerning them happened. So this is, this is here a set of their estimates from the same molecular clocks um, for, the, for the time of origin uh, of crown group cyanobacteria. Again, quite a bit of variation, but, but the clear consensus that this is something that happened well before the GOE. Uh, and then people have, have argued about this quite a bit. So um, just to recap, it does look like um, the uh, relevant biochemical pathway arose about two, two and a half billion years ago. Um, in some common ancestor of these, what are today mostly terrestrial cyanobacteria, um, and has, has been vertically inherited ever since. It's interesting that the origin of this pathway coincides well with both the great oxygenation event and, and the paleoproterozoic glacial events that might have been related to that. Uh, and that's interesting because, you know, again, if our hypothesis is that this UVA sunscreen became necessary upon the introduction of oxygen, which suddenly made UVA dangerous because it made uh, these reactive oxygen species. Um, that means that perhaps this hypothesis uh, agrees with our, with our dating. Um, finally, what I would say is that beyond this idea that perhaps uh, we have found this correlation between the physical environment events and the observation of uh, having this cytonemin biosynthesis pathway, we can also flip this whole exercise on our head and ask, if we believe that cytonemin production should appear at this point in history where oxygen is introduced into the Earth's atmosphere, then we can use our analysis to check any molecular clocks of cyanobacteria as a whole. And we would know that, OK, this, this node here, where, where cyan, or this branch here, where cyanobacterial cytonemic production appears, needs to be somewhere around the GOE. Right? And this actually, and, and this actually would, would determine qu quite a bit of when various other important divergence events in cyanobacterial history appear. And Obviously, it would push the, the origin of crown group cyanobacteria um, into um, the past uh, substantially beyond the, the GOE. So that's all currently, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. So I'm not sure if you highlighted this um, in detail, but uh, there, bacteria, archaea, prokaryotes have a whole host of mechanisms to deal with uh, uh, oxidative stress. Mm -hmm. So related to this, would you see also a concurrent evolution in some of those enzymatic pathways to deal with that, maybe directly related um, uh, to the specific unit, or have you looked into that? We have done at this point, but it is definitely something that uh, we want to do. We want to, in fact, not only um, analyze the relevant um, genes for, for other ways of dealing with oxidative stress, their DNA repair mechanisms and all these things, um, but another approach that we, that we want to take is also um, that, that we're very welcome for any suggestions that we should, any particular genes or gene families that we should look into 
for uh, anything that might be relevant to the, to the physical environment that we're looking into. So if, if anyone has any suggestions about, as you pointed out, the relevant biological process that we're looking at and that might be informative over the same question, or if anyone has any suggestions of any gene or gene family that might be particularly sensitive to perhaps the, the snowball earth events coinciding with, with the GOE or the, subse or the subsequent neoproterozoic oxygenation event. Um, these suggestions are very, very welcome, and we, in fact, see this as a, as a step in a larger study of, 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 of this type. A hey, very cool talk. Um, so I was interested about your molecular clock calibration. Mm -hmm. How many microfossils were you using to calibrate it? So again, to clarify, the molecular clock is not mine. It is from uh, Bettina Schirmeister and others uh, from 2015. Um, the, I would have to look up the exact number. The number is small. Uh, and the cyanobacterial trees are still dictated by the choice of individual calibration points. The number is, is on the order of 3, 5, something like that. Um, I, th I, th I know that you know, one that I think definitely is commonly used is, is the first, um, the first um, cyanobacteria with heterocysts. So, so these uh, sections four and, uh, 4 and 5 here, which, are, which is you know, this, this, this here. And I think this number 2 might actually correspond to one of the calibrations that they used. But it's, it's a small number. That's why we still argue about cyanobacterial timing and history, that the calibrations are so few. That was a really good talk. Um, what's interesting to me is this simultaneous evolution of psi eta psi f. Um, is there any sense of where the proteins were before they were this? Um, great question. I, I didn't go into much of the sort of phylogenetic detail here, but uh, it is interesting that all of them, um, all of them seem to be present, or in, in fact, all of them except for like Psi D, which is not critical for making cytonym in any way. Um, all of them seem to be present in this in this one group, and in most organisms that have any of these, they have all of these. And it's, so it does seem that they came in at the same time. Um, or, or maybe, maybe if, they, if they came in at first, then you know, these incomplete pathways have not been preserved. Um, in terms of where they came from, the, um, if I recall correctly, Psi C and Psi B, but at least two of them had no um, closely related genes whatsoever that you would find when you blast them or something like that. So God knows, there might have been a horizontal gene transfer from, a dis from an extinct lineage, could be anything. Um, some of the others uh, had, um, somewhat closely related um, homologs um, among cyanobacteria and presumably had maybe some other function before. Great. But how this com came together, this is, this is very interesting because these EBO genes that are also critical for making cytonemin, these seem to be, have the other most closely related things in bacteroidates. Um, again, maybe a horizontal gene transfer event from there. It's fascinating how this would have come together. All right, thank you. So we are out of time for questions. Right. Thank you.